I hope I will be able to keep you awake uh, right after the lunch. So uh, looking forward to keeping you engaged. Please uh, just say something if you feel like it's not going the way you want it. <laughs> So I, I would like to look at also some of the key issues and trends that we are seeing around us that's influencing the way we approach education at Parsons and also give some examples of uh, how we are trying to integrate that into what we do in the classroom. Uh, but I, I want to just look back and think about you know, what brought fashion industry to where it is. And in some ways, we know that in 20th century, fashion has become much more democratized and engaged so many of the individuals into it. And that was, first and foremost, because of technology. So even the 19th century technology out of, uh, especially at that time uh, from UK with the Industrial Revolution, is what really allowed us to be able to produce a lot more products, really make fashion something much bigger than what we know from that century forward. Uh, to a level that today we know there's $1.3 trillion generated each year in the apparel sector. And uh, just the fashion retail sector alone in that is a larger GDP than the 126 poorest countries in the world. So that actually reminds us what a big industry it is and why so many people are going into it to be able to be part of the industry, to make a living out of it, and also to make sure that uh, they can contribute to the society in a different way. And the reality is, out of that, I wanted to also remind uh, that 42 percent of the overall retail sector is between two countries, both volume and uh, value. So that's U.S. and China. And we have to also keep that in mind that uh, if you really want to engage with the fashion industry, we are still in a world where it's dominated by the two big players. The, the fact is uh, the industry standards are evolving and it needs to be rethought because we achieved that level of size with a lot of impact uh, on the way we operate. So we know that everything is getting faster and faster. We are producing more, there are more seasons, and ultimately designers are even feeling the burnout in that journey. As educators, we are responsible on understanding the system that we are putting them into and how they're going to find a way to evolve that system to something much more sustainable. So as I mentioned, we are at a, at a point where fashion is more and more in our lives. There's so much product out there, we don't know how to even deal with it as a customer. In this reality, we have to also rethink how to educate the designers of the future in a different way so that they're looking at how to address these issues that they are facing. And on the other hand, not only as designers but also as individuals, we are part of a digital system uh, our identity has evolved to a place where we are facing even a different personality on our digital platforms. In that world, we are representing who we are in a different way to the rest of the world. Uh, all the way to even at this point, we are seeing individuals getting close just to create a certain image and look on their social media platforms and not even necessarily keeping these clothes. And this actually led some of the designers to even experiment with new ideas where we've seen brands like Carlings from Sweden where they were looking at actually only creating digital garments for you to post on your social media. So today you are able to send a digital image of yourself to the company where they can render an outfit for yourself and then send it back to you for $20 so you can post it. So there's something sustainable about that to be said, but also this is a question around what's the role of the fashion designer in the future. So the state of the fashion system is something that we all need to be concerned about. So I, I am happy to say that as a school, we are the oldest fashion degree in US and we graduated some of the top designers in the country. Uh, a lot of the famous designers you know from Tom Ford to Donna Karen to Alexander Wang came out of that school and then they build these big uh, companies that they're running. But that, those big companies that led, to, led the way to building these fast fashion systems is actually creating a lot of challenges also for the industry and everybody in this room and all our society. So we need to understand the overall impact that uh, this kind of a system is creating and find ways of really rethinking it. Uh, so the reality is there's a lot of externalized costs and I know that uh, you will hear also from Karen later on around this issue, 
where we have to recognize that it's not just about the cost of production that needs to be counted in and the revenue that you generate from the product, but all of the other elements, including the impact you have on the environment and the labor, has to be incorporated into that system. So we need to think about it as a much more of a loop, and it's not just about the circularity, but about the whole system and how do we address it. So I feel like there are a lot of initiatives that are taking place that is a kind of in progress to address these challenges. These include things like circularity of the product life cycle is being questioned. We are seeing a lot of new material innovation. We've seen several examples of these. We know that there are a lot of new manufacturing processes that are uh, looking at efficiencies and ways of addressing some of these challenges. So even at the university, we use uh, tools like the uh, Stoll and Shimaseki machines where we're able to bring full automated 3D knitting processes where you can create designs based on demand rather than creating inventory that's gonna go to waste. Uh, we also see new retail solutions that is using technology that's making it much more efficient around how the products are created and sold. Uh, and also, we are seeing a lot of initiatives around rethinking how waste can be used in new applications. So it's not just in fashion, but it's going into construction and many other sectors. Uh, and even we heard a couple examples this morning where there's opportunities for rethinking how we use our waste. So these are all initiatives that are great to address some of these challenge that, challenges that we are seeing. But there are a lot of other key challenges that are out there. And we need to figure out how to use technology to address those as well. So some of these include things like the frequency and amount of products that's being pro uh, produced and sold. The reality is, as a designer, you cannot just think about putting out new collections. You have to also think in about the amount of collections and product you're putting out and what is the impact of that overall to the society. And I feel like technology can help us address some of these issues that I list here. Synthetic materials is another key challenge. We know the issues with micro, uh, uh, bioplastics that's, uh, microplastics that's going into the oceans, and we already have it in our bodies, where we are now a new human ecosystem in our body that contains a lot more plastic than in the past. And uh, the reality is, uh, garment industry is responsible for a big portion of that. The majority of the microplastic uh, in the ocean comes from the garments that are being washed in the laundries. We also need to find a way to localize supply chains and onshoring of on-demand manufacturing, and this can easily be done through use of technologies and new retail systems. That opportunity has not been tapped into yet, but I'm looking forward to seeing new ideas and new startups to really engage with this issue. And also, the fact of the impact of transitioning from low-skill human labor to automated processes has to be addressed. And ultimately, uh, there's going to be a lot of people that it's going to be winning and losing out of this shift with automation. And we need to think about all of the labor that's in these systems, especially in the developing world, on what are they going to do next. Is this the responsibility of the governments, or is it the company's responsibility that are sourcing out of these uh, locations? And then ultimately, there is this conversation around craft to technology, we need to make sure that we don't kill the craft in that journey and find a way to scale craft, artisan work, elevate its value, preserve the skills, culture, and jobs as well. So as we are using technology to bring change, we need to understand its impact on society and how that change can be done in a responsible manner. So succeeding in 21st century requires a different mindset. And we are seeing that uh, one way to address that is designing in a responsible manner and using that is a business opportunity. So we know that human-centered design, inclusive design, and responsible design are key topics that many of my colleagues here already talked about, and it's something that we are looking at integrating in the way we educate at Parsons. And you know, a, a few areas that we are seeing already in the industry that there's a lot of focus, as I mentioned, new materials and techniques, looking at things like low energy, low water use, dry dyeing techniques, biodegradable fibers that are already in progress in the industry, as well as in academia. We're also seeing several examples of new connected wear that's collecting data so that you're able to generate revenue not only from uh, what you sell, but also the data you, look, you collect as a company, as well as provide some additional purpose to the user through that connectivity. We are seeing 3D uh, printing fully being adopted as part of the industry and providing solutions 
on things like prosthetics all the way to what Nike has already done uh, in the, in the uh, near past. Uh, also, with the new retail approaches, we are seeing a new mindset around how they think about engaging the communities. So this is expanding on just selling products to serving a purpose to the customer. Even a, a company like Goop, which has been uh, in place, uh, founded by Gwyneth Paltrow, which was all about the lifestyle and well-being, has been looking at how to build a community to talk about issues of well-being and engage them in a different way so that the product is a follow-up to that engagement and the community that's being built around it. And then, of course, the sharing economy is another key trend that's influencing everything we are doing and the interest in things like designing for repair, and many brands are looking at providing solutions on how to do that. And the logic of leasing is at a place where now we're seeing companies like Rent the Runway successfully adopting new business models and providing solutions that's not about creating new product, but also finding ways of renting products, having repurposed reuse of these products in new ways, both in physical and digital spaces. Uh, for their customers. And ultimately, this is one thing that I am in some ways most excited and fearful about is the full automation of the whole uh, production process, including design. So this is a great opportunity for new business models, but it requires us to rethink the purpose of designer in the future because everything is getting automated to a point where the customer will be able to directly Im get involved in the design process and be able to produce a design and receive their products without necessarily any involvement from a designer or potentially a human being in that journey. So all of these 21st century solutions and production processes are bringing a lot of change. And at the same time, we need to think about the future of education. So to be able to do that, we are looking at how do we push for innovation through different methods. So uh, a few things that we are trying to do at Parsons is looking at, first and foremost, everything that's influencing uh, our education as well as everything around us. So we see three key themes that we want to integrate into everything we teach. So we, we want to make sure that the designer understand the societal context on where they operate, but they are also aware of all the technological advancements and how they use that, as well as they understand the sustainability mandate uh, on how to approach design. To enable that, we actually created new diverse pathways. So in addition to collection, we introduced additional three pathways that includes fashion product, which is really expanding on the idea of what a fashion accessory was. And we allow now designers to graduate from a product pathway that allows them to do anything physical or digital all the way to new retail concepts. As well as materiality for a designer to rethink what is the purpose of material that goes into a finished garment, uh, and also how they engage with that to make it much more effective, sustainable, and much more in, uh, impactful on society. And ultimately, our latest pathway called Fashion Systems and Society, which is intended to take sustainability thinking into its core and look at how do we define the role of designer in society, and how can they create new systems and models to bring change to the world. And this kind of shift actually enabled us to really expand on the way the designer can play a role in society and ultimately build universal design solutions that's good for everybody. And to top it off, we also wanted to change our incentives. So until recently, we used to award designers for the best designer for men's wear, women's wear, and children's wear. So in the past three years, we introduced a new academic award system which is recognizing the process rather than the fin final outputs, which means that now they are competing to be able to showcase how their solutions are appropriate for social innovation, fashion and technology, future textiles, and creative systems. So I, I want to give some examples. Uh, as early as 2015, when we started doing these changes, so one of our designers was Lucy Jones. She also was uh, the last one to be named the women's wear designer since then we introduced new design uh, awards. It has uh, basically focused on seated design. And uh, we have seen several examples of this, but it was also a start within a uh, Parsons School of Design to actually look at a different community uh, with a specific need 
and she was working with uh, individuals that are uh, with the disability where they're not able to stand up and use that experience as a way of creating patterns that's appropriate for that kind of positioning. And she was able to then really build on that and build her company. Uh, and at the end, she also was even invited to exhibit and create a piece for uh, MoMA uh, last year where she was able to show in the exhibition called Items is Fashion Modern. So for a BFA fashion design student to really think out of the box and really lead their engagement in uh, the system in a new way uh, was kind of new and revolutionary for at least in our institution. And with all the changes we've done in our curriculum and these kind of examples led the way in a new way of thinking. So uh, it's not only about uh, social innovation, but also material innovation that we care about. And opening the door allowed students to experiment in different ways. So technology can mean use of uh, machinery and equipment and uh, new scientific research, but it can, mean, it can also mean using existing materials and tools to innovate in a different way. So one of our graduates, Gal, uh, she basically, this is her BFA thesis project as well, she was able to use the background of her father who used to be a, a surfboard maker in, uh, in Israel and use that methodology to come up with a material that can be put together with what exists in a supermarket shelf and mix it together to create a soft material that can be used even in garments or any other products. So just a brief uh, video from her to explain it. Through the collection, I mix surfboard manufacturing knowledge passed to me by my father, who used to manufacture surfboards in Israel in the 70s, with my own craft of fashion design. All the self-made natural biomaterials were made from locally sourced food products and mimic the application properties of the original toxic materials used in surfboard production. I believe in a transparent process of design. Therefore, the materials and their production is meant to be shared. I offer all my material knowledge on my open source platform, makemorethcollective.com, for other makers to use, and by that, help facilitate a community of sustainable design. My name is Gal Yakubovich, and this is Make Mort Collective. And what's great with what Gal was doing is actually, it's, uh, you talked about patent and having, uh, making sure that you have the rights to what you produce. In her case, she's doing it all open source. She's actually hosting workshops, engaging with other makers, creating a space where you can learn how to create a biomaterial that can biodegrade by itself. You can do it in your own kitchen, but also using other industrial processes, including a rotational molding and other processes to come up with a finished product that fashion has never used. Uh, so th this is a new way of thinking for designers and it can even happen out of fashion design. Uh, so designing for society has always been a key topic for uh, fashion industry. Uh, and you know, we've seen other examples as well earlier. Another student from Parsons who was looking at the refugee crisis uh, during the Syrians move into Europe was able to really create a collection that was transformable that could have been used also for these refugees. So in this case, you're seeing a tent that, that turns into a jacket as well. And her whole collection was with a similar mindset around uh, flotation devices, uh, baby carrying devices, a tent, as well as a coat. And uh, she now uh, is running her own business. She raised money through Kickstarter and uh, she's able to support it as a for-profit and a non-profit, both for people that are using it for outdoor industry as well as uh, for supporting refugees around the world. And all the materials she used, she actually spent time in, the, in Lesbos, in the Greek island, where a lot of these refugees were, taking all of the scraps from the island and turning them into uh, repurposed garments that can be reused by everyone. Another quite interesting project that integrates a different approach to technology uh, and a key topic uh, for our students, because 80% of our uh, student body at Parsons is female as well, is around menstruation, menstrual rights. So we decided to engage with a factory uh, that's been working on high absorbency undergarments, which is a relatively new technology that is being introduced into the market. I mean, we wanted to create a solution that's appropriate for a community that's much more in need 
than somebody living in the West. So through that engagement, we reached out and worked with the factory Hela as well as UNFEA and decided to work uh, with, uh, with this factory to do a partnership in the refugee camps in Kenya and create a solution that's meeting the mastroom needs of the woman uh, based on their body shape, sizes, cultural and uh, religious needs. Uh, and ultimately, we are now introducing this product in the refugee camps this November, where we are going to be launching it together with UNFPA in their 50th year uh, celebration. And uh, another one we've done was around the hospital gown. Again, similar themes. We were looking at sustainability and the, the dignity of the uh, individual, where we created a garment uh, that was much more appropriate for the industry. And ultimately, it's also a new experience for a design school working with students, creating something that's directly for uh, commercial use. So this is uh, being used by hospitals where we go into bidding with our partner that's a healthcare startup and selling this product also on retail on the website. And uh, I know I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to uh, quickly go to two last examples. Uh, so one of them is a recent graduate from this year, really integrating technology in a new way. So Chimera is an artificial intelligence buddy that he has created. Uh, so he started his journey at MIT in computer science and finished with us in fashion. And ultimately, he created this AI tool online where, as a customer, you're directly designing with the AI to come up with a design solution uh, with your body measurements. Uh, where jointly you're creating a finished garment that ultimately comes out as a tech pack and it gets sent to a factory to be produced. In this case, there's no designer involved. So it's exactly what I was saying, that the challenge of a designer creating a tool which will make all designers obsolete is ultimately where things are going to go and we really need to question what's the role of the designer in this journey. And finally, even all the way on the social side, using also approaches from a, a technical side and technological side, we've seen one of our designers, uh, Natalia Riedel, looking at mental health care and understanding the issues related to uh, sizing and body and using rehabilitation as a way of guiding her, creating new uh, underwear solutions that are sizeless, that can be manipulated by the individual according to the different shapes that they have. So thank you for listening, and uh, any questions, I'm happy to answer later. Thank you very much, Mr. Chakmak. Please be seated.